All right, everyone, uh, welcome to Jacob's Hall. Thank you for coming, even despite the rain, and in fact, to celebrate the rain, hashtag get rid of drought, basically. This is all good. Um, so welcome to Jacob's Hall. Who here is their first time in the building? All right, well, welcome, by all means. Uh, my name's Eric Paulos. I'm a faculty here in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. I'm also the Chief Learning Officer here um, at the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation. Uh, we're gonna uh, start, we have this design conversations which you are uh, attending. I wanna tell you we've started this series last semester and it's gonna be continuing on throughout this semester. Um, Oh, yeah, that's fine. No, that's fine. I can, I can, I can dance too while I'm going. Uh, and it features a, uh, a wide range of designers that come in and have conversations and provoke us with questions around design and critical thinking around design here at Berkeley. Uh, we try to look for a diverse range of visions and perspectives. Uh, I also, I just want to give you a little bit of forward pointer before we get started with today's speaker. Uh, next Friday will be another one of these design conversations with Yoon Lee. He's the Vice President of Insight, Concept, and Portfolio at Samsung Electronics. And he leads the Home Appliances Product uh, Division. So you'll want to also see the perspective that uh, Yoon is bringing to this as well. And then I know people will have, will we run off, do things during spring break, think deeply about design. But right when you come back from spring break, the very next Friday, uh, we'll have Greg Petrop, who's the Chief Experience Officer at GE Software and General Manager of the User Experience Center of Excellence at GE. Uh, those of you that are a little less familiar with Jacobs, we offer a host of uh, classes here. There's about 25 classes in the building. We support student groups. There's also a lot of events and activities. You're attending one of them. And for those of you that have your calendars out, you're going to want to definitely mark uh, May 4th and 5th. That's a Wednesday and a Thursday during RRR week because there will be a huge design exhibition here. You get a chance to see all of the fabulous student work that's gone on. I also want to thank the staff that's been really helpful in bringing all the programs, particularly this one, together. Uh, Laura, Emily, Amy, Roland, Alita, to name a few. So thank you and thank them on the way out because they really pulled this whole program together. And today is a special um, speaker and I'm honored to be presenting Shannon Jackson who will be actually introducing our speaker. Shannon, as many of you know, is a professor in rhetoric and performance studies. Uh, she has numerous acclaimed books in, on sort of performance media and social practices, and her own research passions kind of lie at this intersection of visual performing and media art and the role of arts in social institutions and social change. Uh, she directs the Arts Research Center, for those of you that have hopefully had a chance to interact with it. Um, in fact, I was very honored to be uh, kind of participate more as an audience member in a small but interesting activist performance just last Wednesday during her noon Big Ideas lecture series, which is down at the Berkeley Art Museum um, with the Yes Men Art Collective. This is quite interesting. Um, and perhaps most exciting for us also in at Berkeley is the fact that Shannon's recent appointment by our chancellor to a newly created and important leadership role here as associate vice chancellor for arts and design. And here at Jacobs, we're obviously really interested in furthering the role of creativity and design, and we're really excited about uh, the ability to participate in the emerging vision of arts and design under her leadership. And with that, it's a pleasure to introduce Shannon. Thank you. Okay, thank you to Eric. Uh, I'm uh, really thrilled. First of all, I'll reiterate the thanks to the staff and the thanks to Eric, including the staff of Berkeley Center for New Media and the Arts Research Center who collaborated with Jacobs today. Uh, it is a real thrill to welcome uh, Steve Johnson who's come up here from Mountain View to share his time with us. Uh, if you, uh, you pro some of you may read a bit about his biography if you looked at our website ahead of time. Uh, Steve is a truly innovative and path-breaking design executive in the Silicon Valley and someone who, as a leader, is beloved of everyone who works with him. Mm. I have that, I have in, inner knowledge there. <laughs> uh, and, and if you also read that biography, you know that Steve is currently the Vice President of User Experience Design at LinkedIn and that he got his start uh, uh, when he was 
uh, privileged in one of his first jobs, privileged to be a skills trainer uh, for our autistic children. And it was in that environment that he began to derive a design philosophy based on watching uh, human patterns of behavior and thinking uh, innovatively and expansively about the assumptions we use to interpret and navigate our world. And I think we'll hear a bit more about that design philosophy today. You might also know that he moved from that post to the kids division at Electronic Arts where he was a uh, lead designer in uh, user experience for many of its important products including the family album creator and from there he moved on to become a senior product architect at Adobe leading design for some of its most important products including the Elements uh, Suite, the uh, Acrobat line and the Creative Suite of Adobe, which I hope all of you know that thanks to the efforts of people like Jen Stringer and Bill Allison and others in this room, uh, we at Berkeley uh, have the, uh, any student and any staff member at Berkeley has access to the full creative suite. Thanks to our partnership with Adobe, this man is part of, um, and part of, was partly responsible for creating it. Since 2009, Steve has been head of user experience at LinkedIn, making that harrowing process of job search job searching um, more fun and more meaningful for many of us and also uh, has, hap has worked from there to think more expansively about the nature of design and about the techniques of great designers. I know he's going to talk more about that here. Obviously, Steve's specialty is in the creation and the design of, you could say, experiential forms, user forms, but I happen to know he's also just as interested in physical, in designing physical forms and material forms, including the design and function of automobiles. Yes. And he has a very <laughs> deep <hurt>. and <laughs> absolutely um, staggering expertise in that area. <laughs> I, uh, I actually am the daughter of somebody who also, my father also had a lifelong uh, fixation uh, and love of automobiles. He built them. He. Uh, read about them, he tinkered with them all his life. He was also, incidentally, a mechanical engineering major here at Berkeley. Uh, and so when I think actually about welcoming Steve today now as this campus administrator <laughs> in the arts and design here at my dad's alma mater, I also find myself reflecting about our commitment to explore here at Jacobs and elsewhere all things design. Uh, and to create in our student body a lifelong love of creative innovation. So as we continue that grand and wide pursuit, whether we're talking about the creation of graphics or products or fashion or buildings or apps or cities or murals or sculptures or performances and experiences of all varieties, I hope that you'll join me in welcoming Steve Johnson, who shares, I think, an abiding interest in all things design and in the capacity of good design to create new patterns and new behaviors that might change the world. Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, yes. So she just covered like 40% of my presentation. <laughs> So I'll try to go fast, but hi, I'm Steve. Um, I do talks in a fairly simple way. Um, I always tell people a little bit about me, just so you know who I am. And then I talk um, about what I've done so that I can hopefully establish some level of credibility and then we can jump into the talk. I also love it when people jump in and ask questions, so please just feel free, chime in, or we can do a Q&A after. So about me first. Um, I, I, so my wife and I, I've got one wife, one kid, and one cat. And I always make sure to specify that order. You know, we had two cats, but now we only have one. It's kind of sad. But our little boy, Bryce, um, he thinks that he's a DJ. He's 11. So he's always kind of you know, trying to mess with DJ equipment. He's also a black belt, though. So what he does is he mixes his own music to do routines to. But it's normally stuff like TV commercials, et cetera. And it's, it's kind of odd. You guys can go to my Facebook page and look at that. Um, I love fashion, but I hate couture. 
And I always bring that up because I think that if it's pretty but it's not useful, you know, it doesn't make sense. It makes it pretty useless. And I think that when you're talking about fashion design specifically, there's a way that people want to look and then there's how they'll actually be able to function and be careful, I'm sorry, and be comfortable. So if you go to New York Fashion Week or those kinds of things, you can normally find me with some of the lower end designers. The high end couture ones really don't do anything for me. Um, I'm a massive music fan. I love music. And just to make sure we're all on the same page here, music does not include Taylor Swift or country. And it's just a dozen. <laughs> and we can debate this later. I was giving a talk at a university once. A young lady walks up and says, I'm really mad about your Taylor Swift comments. And I asked her if she was into Demi Lovato. She said, yeah. And I said, you've got no credibility with me. So my comments stand. So <laughs> we can do that later. But here's the reality, though. Look, this is Foo Fighters, right? And this is 100,000 people at Wembley. And if there's anything that I've always wanted to do is just imagine that I could expose my passion to 100,000 folks that would stand in line for three and a half hours and tolerate me for six. So these guys rule. Um, I'm really into interior design even more than exterior architecture. Interiors is where you live. It's what you actually touch and feel. It's the way that you actually are. And I think that exterior architecture is amazing, but that's just how it looks. You can have a gorgeous building that once you get inside doesn't feel right. So what's great about this hall was when I saw it from outside, I'm like, oh, that's pretty. But then I was very interested to actually walk in and feel it. Now that I see the room and the space, this is amazing to me. So that's the kind of thing that really resonates. Um, yeah, I'm a car guy. And when I give these talks at work, everyone kind of laughs. But you know, I like to change that. I, I tell my wife that I'm an automotive design aficionado. And uh, it doesn't work on her. But um, <laughs> there's something very interesting to me about um, transportation in general. And especially when you're talking about car companies that start with the driver's seat first and they work their way out. And that's been something that I've seen with a lot of companies lately. And then the very last one is tech. Um, I love technology. But more importantly, how I believe we are going to interact with it. I'm a firm believer that life imitates art and not vice versa. And with that, um, I always ask this question because uh, I get asked a lot who I think the greatest design mind of all time is. It's this guy. So here's my quick tangent. Does anyone know who this is? No? Out loud? Gene, who said that? Right, who's the first, yeah? It's Gene, okay. So here's the thing. I've given so many talks about this. There's all these kids that are like, who are Gene Roddenberry? So <laughs> I shall tell you. This is the greatest design thinker of all time as far as I'm concerned. Here is why. Gene invented the Motorola flip phone. <laughs> Gene invented the iPad. <laughs> Gene invented Google Glass, <laughs> right? Hold on, there's more. Gene invented the taser. Gene invented the Bluetooth headset, OK? Gene also invented Oculus for Facebook. Gene invented Skype. And what I'm waiting for Gene and Elon to invent is the transporter. Now, my point, though, is this. All of these things were from 1960s Star Trek. And I am absolutely convinced that it was the inspiration of young men and women that saw that show back then that made them say, we can do more, we can build more. As I'm seeing these amazing 3D printers, even in this environment, I'm thinking back to all the sci-fi films I used to watch when all of that was just normal. And I'm saying, somebody in that room had to have said, well, I can do that, let me build that. So if there's anything that I can pass on to all of you, it's really look to Hollywood and all these things that you think are amazing, like the Iron Man suit, and then just go, well, how do we do that? And you may not be able to build the exact thing, but that's what people are really kind of expecting from experiences. So that's kind of the end of my tangent. All right, so let's talk about my career. I'll go fast, since Shannon already told you. <laughs> so um, I worked with autistic kids when I very first got started, and that was incredibly fulfilling to me. And I never thought that I was going to be a designer from that. OK, good, I'm making sure the video is up. I'm sorry. Um, but I started working in group homes. And what we learned quickly was what I was actually good at was redesigning attributes of the group home for the autistic clients. So if you don't have full dexterity in your hands, if you can't move things, et cetera, even if you have problems with a knife, with lots of Velcro, wood, and duct tape, we modified things. And that's what got me into design. I started realizing that that was something that I really wanted to do. From there, I went to EA. And I was part of EA Sports and then EA Kids. 
And what was great about that was learning multi-platform before there were lots of different platforms. Like now we have Android, iOS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Back then, you just had all the gaming consoles and how you had to actually develop for the PC, the Mac, or then with the Sega Genesis, yeah, I'm aging myself, but it's all right. When the Genesis was out, you know, Nintendo's box, what was Nintendo's first box called again? It wasn't the Wii, the N64, right, yeah. N64, that kind of thing. It was really interesting on how we had to make sure we developed those games differently. Adobe is um, where I learned the most about product design and everything you hate about Photoshop is my fault, I'm sorry. Um, it's true, <laughs> it's, it's my fault, it's still there too. I downloaded it like the CC a couple months ago, I'm like, that's still there? I, I, I don't believe that, I don't get rid of anything. But the Creative Suite was one of the hardest things I'd ever done because it was, we did uh, CS1 and 2, bringing together Photoshop, Illustrator, ImageReady, Dreamweaver, and Flash. We had just purchased Macromedia, et cetera. That taught me a tremendous amount about standardization, thinking about patterns, pattern alignment, and also one size doesn't fit all. And then there's these guys, LinkedIn. Um, I've been with LinkedIn for seven years, and that's been a, interesting because that's been, that taught me a lot about hypergrowth. Um, I was employee number 360, and we're at 10,000 people now. My team, when I joined, was 18 people. It hit a height of 340. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a massive ride, but it's also been interesting to watch the web develop and then think about how mobile does that. Speaking of LinkedIn, this talk will not be about LinkedIn. This is not a recruiting exercise. I'm not gonna answer questions about why we send so much email. Yes, I can, it's okay. You can ask me. But um, everything that I'm talking to you about is just the way that I feel about design. So please don't think that this is a LinkedIn talk because it's not. All right, so I'm really big on this. Um, People talk about great designers, and I don't believe that greatness is so much about the what, it's the how. And that's literally what this entire talk's gonna be about if I don't trip over this cord and fall in front of all of you. <laughs> this whole talk is going to be about the things that I think great designers do and how they do it. I, I'm not gonna go into schemorphic versus flat or if you should be using Sketch or Photoshop and all those kinds of things, I don't really care. I will talk about the person that I believe you need to be to build great products. And again, at any time, please raise your hand, we could have a conversation. All right, so here's the first thing. This is really, really, really big. Um, I believe great designers look for competing perspectives. And it is the word competing. I think that normally you can get into group think to where everybody around you is a fanboy and they're like, yeah, this is great. And that's all you guys do and you move forward and you don't think about competing perspectives. I'm also really big on if you're in a capacity to hire, you should look for people that A, are different than you, but are also representative of your target audience. Right now in the Valley, there's lots of conversation about diversity and inclusion. I think that all of them are very powerful, but I like to take the conversation to different and just say, hire people that have different perspectives because your audience most likely has different perspectives. So I spend a lot of time asking people that I know hate my stuff, what do you think of it and why? And if any of you are connected to me on LinkedIn, you'll see me quite often asking people that I know are very upset about the platform if they'd be interested in having coffee or a conversation. And I probably do about 10 a week, simply because I want to hear that perspective. I think really, really, really great design leaders that I've met my entire career, they do that. And I think it's something that all of you should think about. Don't assume that what you're doing is the best idea in the entire planet, because I'm positive you think it is, but the person next to you may not, and they may offer you something that makes it even better. Two. So teamwork needs to be a natural behavior. And it sounds very cliche, but it's very, very, very important. So something that I look for is hardcore collaborators. And again, I think that you probably hear this kind of thing all the time, but it's so important. I, I make this as a hiring you know, um, mandate. When we're working with people, I always want to find out how they collaborate. Zappos, for instance, does anyone know the Tony Shai Zappos story about the um, shuttle? Right, yeah. So what Zappos did, and, and this is just amazing, um, they're in Vegas, so everybody has to get shuttled in from the airport. And no matter how well that person did on the interview, they go and they talk to the shuttle driver. <laughs> they do, and they say, how did that person treat you? How were they? What kind of a person were they? If that shuttle driver doesn't say this person was genuine, that person doesn't get the job. 
there's something about that level of saying it's that important for us to have people that collaborate that's really inspirational to me. And I think that when you're working with a team, especially when you're coming out of college and you're going into the workforce, you really kind of have to put aside that this is just for me to get the grade. It's for us to score. If that makes any sense. I love people that are hardcore bridge architects. And I know that most people say bridge builders, but bridge builders are people that can just hammer the thing together. I mean an architect. Someone that really thinks about this is the goal. This is the thing that we have to do. This is, what, this is the, the goal that we have to achieve. How are we going to architect success? But then also, how are we going to architect it across these divisions and departments? If it's a company, if it's school, if it's whatever. When, we, um, when my wife and I had Bryce, we had some medical complications when he was being born. And watching those surgical teams work together as one was amazing. And that's where I got this philosophy of bridge architects. I want to meet the person that trained four different medical teams to make it so that my little boy could be born and then annoy the crap out of me for the next 11 years. <laughs> I love amplifiers, and um, I've only been called out on this video clip once. Somebody asked me if this is Step It Up 4, and I said, of course it is. <laughs> they also asked me if I'd watched the movie enough time to remember this clip, and I said, of course I did. <laughs> I'm okay with that. It's okay. It's all right. Amplifiers means people that understand the natural talents of everybody on the team, and they know when it's time for everybody else to come in. And it almost comes across as choreography when it's done super, super, super well. It's like jazz. It's improvisation. But it's knowing that like, if the trombone player really knows that this trumpet player is going to be able to hit this lick, they back off in unison, in time. No one practiced that, but it just comes across. That kind of thing is what I believe makes great designers. But you can only achieve that if you are honestly invested in the people that you're working with. And if you know them well enough to know what they're good at and when it's time to amplify their skills. I have a question. Please. How would you differentiate between a bridge architect and an amplifier? One more time. How would you differentiate between a bridge architect and an amplifier? Yeah, OK, so the question is, how would I differentiate between a bridge architect and an amplifier? A bridge architect to me is, is that before we actually build the bridges in the planning stages, I'm saying, how are we going to do that? How are we going to loop in other departments, other teams? And how are we going to make sure that we have really solid collaboration? The amplifier to me is at runtime, because no matter how good that plan was, it's not going to work. So at runtime, when the fit hits the shan and all these anomalies come up that we didn't think about, that amplifier is like, wait a minute, I know who to get, instead of we just keep on trudging forward no matter what. Does that make sense? OK. I love this clip of MJ, because um, as far as being inspirational goes, these are all of his mess ups. And I learned a lot. Um, I watched a documentary on him, and he was talking about how much he had failed. Because when you think about like great sports stars, it's always about winning, winning, winning. Like I would love to meet Steph Curry and say, talk to me about when you lost. I don't care about when you won. I've seen all that on ESPN 100,000 times. What MJ was um, talking about that was great, and it's very inspirational to me, is he's very big on the fact that he was horrible as a three-point line shooter. Greatest basketball player of all time horrible from three-pointers. He was practicing one day. ESPN came in and said, hey, we saw you practice. You're not doing any three-pointers. How come? MJ said, because I'm not good at three-pointers. Something about that was inspirational to me. And I think the more that you can tell stories about failure, but then show how you learned and how that became success, that's the makings of a great designer. Also, I believe great designers seek that out. Go ask the story. Right? Figure out what's a product that you absolutely love and don't fanboy out about, oh my god, I love Instagram so much, it's so awesome. No, wait a minute. What is it that you guys did that you learned from Instagram? We had the founder of Insta at LinkedIn a month ago and we asked him, so what's up with the square photos? And he said, well, we were coding it ourselves and we couldn't figure out how to do portrait and landscape, so we made them square. <laughs> <laughs> And the whole room's like, oh. <laughs> like, we wanted like some innovative, like, oh, harkens back to like the Ozzelblad, right? No, no, it just we couldn't figure out how to do that. And what I thought was just so inspirational about that is I'm like, yeah, yeah, that works. And I hate you now. All right. Um, <laughs> another thing about great designers to me, uh, look. They have to be highly engaged, but they have to be emotionally available. Now, I want to make sure I'm very clear to the introverts in the room. I'm not asking any introvert to become an extrovert. 
be an introvert, be yourself. Being emotionally available does not mean you have to become an ex extrovert. I happen not to be bugged standing in front of a hundred and some odd people. I'm an extreme extrovert. My wife would not be here right now. She'd be somewhere underneath the closet, <laughs> like hiding with her head. But she's still emotionally available. Why does that matter for great designers? I think that if a great designer is emotionally available, two things happen. One, that comes out in his or her work. It really does. That's the how, and I mean that. For some reason, when it comes to products, people challenge me on that a lot. But when it comes to restaurants, fine food, or fashion, no one says anything. If we go to a five-star restaurant, you have this idea that like the chef in the back is like so into the food and like just loves it, right? It's like this entire uh, ratatouille thing going on. That availability for that master chef to be emotionally available for all the other chefs, not only to be a mentor and a coach, but to help people along is incredibly important. And that's what makes him or her better at their trade because they allow themselves to talk to other people, to mentor other people, and to educate other people. And it's not a competition. All right. Oh, that one did work, sorry. Humble. Does anyone know who this kid is? No? Only had one person be able to, no? This is Jake Barnett. There's the old saying, don't try to be the smartest person in the room. Jake's the smartest person in this room right now. He is. His IQ has been logged as being, uh, uh, he has surpassed Einstein, and he is currently um, redoing some of Einstein's theories. Jake is 15 years old. He also has a hard time tying his shoes because he's autistic. This is one of the most humble kids I've ever met in my entire life. I had the pleasure of meeting him at a TEDx talk a long time ago. I didn't know who he was. I was in line to get some chocolate chip cookies. He's like, can I cut in line? I said, no. We started talking about music. I gave him one of my cookies. Five minutes later, he's on stage. And I'm like, oh, you're Jake. <laughs> now, <laughs> well, I didn't know. <laughs> you know, little kid, dirty jeans, the little U UCLA hat on, I mean, Cal hat on. Anyhow, the thing about him, though, is, is that he is so humble as an individual that back to my emotionally available, it makes it so that you can walk up and talk to him. I think as a great designer, you really need to learn that. You need to understand that no matter how great, you're, no matter how great the product is that you're working on or the skills that you have, you still need to be humble. Because if you're doing your job correctly, you're learning, you're teaching, and you're sharing, which means that you're passing this on to somebody that might be able to surpass you one day. And again, these are all the attributes that I think go into the work. So for those that are saying, oh, I was really hoping on hearing about how materials come together. Materials come together well when you have people that understand them and are humble about asking questions to try to figure out what two things we can put together. You need change agents. And um, this goes back to my whole thing about music. And it sucks, because I show this slide, how people in the room weren't even born when Madonna started out. But you all know who she is. You really want designers to understand that I need to be an agent of change. And I also need to change with the times as much as humanly possible. And I have a slide coming up that's talking about trend setting. But I think that being change agent and trend setting is very similar. So maybe I'll drop that slide out. But anyhow. It's super important to understand where the world is going and how you can help lead it there. But then also, what are the things that I can do that can maybe pivot the world? This is one of the few slides that I actually don't talk over. And it's because I want everybody to, to see one scene. And I think that it'll get to my point of being genuinely empathetic. And it's the elevator scene. Normally, there's like soft music. I could hum along if you guys would like. All right, here we go. This always resonates with me because you have three people in an elevator at the same place, at the same time, totally different lives, totally different. If you're going to be a great designer, you need to not only be empathetic for the people that you're working with, but the people that you're designing for. Talk about the people that you're working with. You do not know how hard it was for that person to get to work today, and you do not know what they're battling with in the back of their mind that they haven't told you about. It's the bottom line. It's important to think about that. I'll do design critiques sometimes. Somebody will just bomb. Before I just determine or just kind of make this judgment call that it's because they didn't do their job correctly, I try to imagine that maybe they just got a phone call that their mom had a stroke. 
I'm serious. Nine times out of 11, that's not the reason why. They just forgot to, to do the assignment. But <laughs> however, there's still just that idea of don't assume that everybody is exactly like you and has the same things going on that you have going on. Be empathetic enough to ask questions and you know, figure it out. Your customers, when you're building products for people, there's the way that we want them to use it, and then there's the way that they use it. The people that can't figure it out aren't idiots. When I was at Adobe, it was really interesting because we had this engineering team that's like, what do you mean by they can't use the layers palette? They're just being stupid. We're not going to dumb it down. No, the layers palette's freaking hard. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and they're not stupid. We haven't designed this thing to make it easy enough yet. And then we added symbols and, uh, never mind, don't talk to me about that. <laughs> Anyhow, all I'm saying is, is that great designers are empathetic and they don't make assumptions that everyone's life is just like theirs. Be inclusive. Great designers are super inclusive, and it's really kind of that camaraderie and bringing people together and making sure that it's a party. I try to have parties as much as humanly possible because I'm not the smartest guy in the room, so I try to create an environment that like somebody says something really smart that I can take credit for. And I think that when you're inclusive, though, and you're known for that, you really become a designer that really brings out even better ideas. Because back to my point earlier about introverts and extroverts, I really, I mean, I go and I hammer on my extroverts to make sure to pull the introverts up, to make sure that you're including them. And if you're ever having a meeting and there's somebody sitting at the table that didn't say something, find an opportunity to softball something to them so that they can have their voice heard or meet with them afterwards and have a conversation and ask them how they felt about the conversation. It's little things like that that I think not only make really good designers, but make great design leaders. And speaking of design leaders, don't be hierarchical. I think that a lot of the titles, especially in big companies, came from the military. I love when you have as flat an organization as humanly possible, says the guy with the VP title. But before we had to kind of go to titles, even at LinkedIn, we were just flat. I think that a company gets to a certain scale to where you have to start dulling some of this out, but you don't have to be that. And I think that really good designers not only don't have to lead this way, but don't have to design this way to where every single thing they're designing has to fit inside this nice, neat little box. You've got to think outside the edges, and that can only be accomplished if you let the best ideas surface to the top, regardless of where that person stands within either that social environment or et cetera, et cetera. All right. Number four, great designers promote, invite, and defend the quirky ones. I hated this movie. I did, man. I sat there. I'm like, what? But you know what? Just this scene, just, I don't know. And it's great because I've watched it enough times to where my son and I do it on Saturday nights when my wife's not home. Just like, there's, I think there's a YouTube video of us doing this. I, I don't know. Anyhow, <laughs> you want to find, this, I know, it's funny. You're gonna, this is not going to leave your head. <laughs> It's going to be like four in the afternoon. You're going to be like, vote for Pedro. OK, so <laughs> you want to find a way that you want to bring out the unique attributes of people. And you want to make sure that you don't repel that. You don't want to be one of the antibodies that gets this guy off campus. Well, no, I do. But you want to find a way to make sure that quirky personalities are actually the thing that is a part of your own team and that you don't suppress it yourself. I've had a lot of designers. Um, show me their work later, but not the work that they presented. And the work that they showed me later was 10 times better. And I asked them, why didn't you show this? And they were afraid of the critique. And the critique that they were afraid of was it wasn't in line with everybody else's. It didn't conform. So they were actually fearful that if their work didn't conform to everybody else's, it must be bad. And it was crazy. So for the past couple years, we've been making sure that in our design critiques, we're actually asking people to think past that, think past that, think past that. If I see three designs that are way too similar, I ask them, OK, do me a favor. Go to your laptop and pull up the stuff you think that I was going to hate, because all of this is just like the last person's, and it's not unique enough. So now we have this culture of try to bring this really unique thinking to the table and don't be afraid to be quirky. And then also, though, as a design leader, and I always go back to this, you can be a great designer, but you're a great design thinker and leader if you're amplifying others. If you saw that somebody else was doing something that was super cool, but then during critique they didn't show it, get them to. Because in a lot of cases, that might be the thing that wins, or at least it's funny to look at. Trendsetters. This kind of goes back to the Madonna clip, but I think that it's important for you to also think about being around and 
getting people on the team that you think are trendsetters. It's, it's so important. Like, right now, we're having all these conversations about how do you design for millennials? And what I think is interesting is, is that these are just people. It's not like millennials are different. They just grew up differently. There's different trends, different things that they use every single day. There's different applications that they use in concert with LinkedIn, and most of them don't actually use LinkedIn for certain reasons, so we need to figure out why. What are the trends that are currently going on that this person is growing up with? And don't try to force them into using things our way. Figure out what they're using and just adapt. I love gutsy people. Um, it's funny, I'm a total X game fanatic who won't get on a dirt bike because I'll break every bone in my body and my wife will say, I told you so. But I love people that take risks and they go big. And when I say big, I mean big. I love folks that can hit that. And even if you fail, the fact that you tried is ridiculous. And I think that that's how you can help move a business forward. Companies that get my attention were ones that took such a crazy risk. I remember when Snapchat first came out, I said, dude, I just don't get this. And then I started playing with it, and I went, oh, I understand. And I think that in this world of you want to keep and archive everything, this idea of my communication disappears in 16 seconds, what's that for? So when I ha had an opportunity to, to meet the founders and I was talking to them about what really motivated them, they said that they wanted to take a massive risk and disrupt the way that um, messaging was across the ecosystem, and it's paid off. That, to me, is a massive, gutsy move. Um, adaptive. We need people that are adaptable, and I believe great designers are adaptable. And in a lot of cases, it means breaking their own mold and getting out of their own comfort zone, but not being afraid to adapt depending on what the environment calls on. And obviously, this goes in line with some of the previous points, but the reason I always just kind of go into this animation from the VW group is because when they're thinking about car design, they're literally just thinking about the ability for people to have transportation, and then it should be able to adapt to whatever their current needs are. I think that's a really great way to think about your design. Here's my design for who? This particular user. Well, if it was for a different user, how would I adapt it and modify it? Oh, I might do something different. Don't be married to it. I'm a kid at heart. Um, my son and I still play in the dirt. It's great, because I love that he's 11, but when he was four, he was so much more fun, because whatever I said, he's like, yeah, that's great. Now he like, challenges me on crap, it sucks. But you really need to stay and remember this. You need to remember what it was like when you played in the dirt. You really need to remember when your imagination was going completely wild, and when that little mound was a bridge, and when this little stick was a car, or whatever. Whatever the thing was, Find that element in your life to where you were absolutely super creative and keep that. Because all the best designers I've ever met, they have kept that. And when you talk to them, you hear it. It comes out, it oozes. And you can almost like imagine seeing baby pictures of them and you're like, yeah, that's pretty much what I thought you were doing because they really haven't changed that much. They're bigger, they're taller. In some cases, they don't have hair and they've gained weight. But you know, they, um, they've really just kind of adapted and kept that creativity. And I think it's very important. All right, two more points. I believe great designers understand the difference between urgent and important. I've been asked several times what I believe the difference is. It's kind of simple to me. I think that urgent is super important to someone else. I think important is super important to me. And the reason why I think that that's important is because in a lot of cases, if you have a really good designer that has to work on something that's urgent, if he or she does not find that thing to be important themselves, they are not going to do good work which means that you need to make sure that you give them the reason why this is important, what the goal is, and get them to be super passionate uh, about it, or they're just gonna phone it in. There's very few people that I think know the difference, but I've met some wonderful ones. One of the chief designers at the Volkswagen Group, really, 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 like every single one of his tasks are what's in the urgent bucket, what's in the important bucket, and he only works on things that are important ever. So when his team is pitching him on things, they literally use language like, the reason we believe this is important, and we want you to also, is because, and then nothing ever becomes a panic. It's never urgent. You never need to call in the fire department. 
Last thing. I believe great designers are direct reflections of their company culture, direct reflections. And of course, I'm going to show Apple's work here. Anytime you hear Johnny talk, after my wife gets over the hotness factor and the accent, you really kind of see this guy lives this. He is a direct reflection of it to the extent that the past four or five Apple events, it's the Johnny video that we're all like waiting for. Like, oh, what's Johnny going to say about the watch? Which Johnny sh should say a lot about that watch. But you need to be a direct reflection of your work, the company that you work for, the institution that you're working with. At LinkedIn, we have three values. Jeff um, says that he really kind of values three things. So one of the things that I do every single year when I'm deciding if I'm actually going to stay with the company is I ask myself, am I emulating these behaviors? So here they are. Behavior one, he says dream big. Dream the biggest dream humanly possible. So is that something that I believe that I still do? So if I get up every single morning and go to work, if I believe that I can still dream big, then I'm in the right place. If people that meet me believe that I am still a huge dreamer, and if we're collaborating or if I'm giving a talk or if I'm whatever, if they still say, Steve, we think that you're a dreamer, then I'm still in the, uh, a good spot. Have fun. This is my favorite clip to show because I don't have to see it and I'm going to watch half this room get sick. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it is important to have fun as a great designer or a great design leader. It's one of the most important things in the entire world. I see a couple of you getting woozy. It's great. <laughs> no, I'm serious, right? It's like, I don't want to watch. <laughs> right? And again, these are literally questions that I ask myself. Since our company culture is based on dream big, have fun, and then I'll go to the third one. I ask myself, am I still having fun? And then I ask my employees, are you still having fun? And a question that I ask lots of designers that I meet that I admire, I ask them, so what do you do for fun? And when they say, I'm doing it, I know that they're in the right spot. All right, last one. Get shit done. This is Jeff's big thing. Depending on what room I'm in, I either say get stuff done or get shit done. It depends. This room seems mature enough. <laughs> Nobody odd or, oh, he cussed. <laughs> Anyhow, it is super important that we get things done. That doesn't mean that we get things done quickly without quality. We get things done quickly with quality. And we don't make that trade off of, well, you either have speed or quality. Whatever engineer made that up, I want to meet that guy. You can have quality and speed. You can have them both, as long as you just understand what the requirements are. So back to my thing about every single year, January 1st, I make a decision on if I'm going to do another year at my current company. As far as this criteria goes, in order for me to make sure that I emulate the company values, I ask myself, am I, ha am I dreaming big? Am I having fun? Am I getting shit done? And that's all I got. So we can open it up to Q&A. That's my contact info. Thank you very much for your time. Questions? Hi. Hold on. Mike's coming your way. And I'd love to know your name, because you all know mine. <laughs> uh, I'm Emily. I'm the program director here at Jacobs. I just have a quick question. Is there a story on your Twitter handle? Is there? Oh, yeah. It's my, uh, yeah. I wish there was like more behind it. It's my license plate on my car. <laughs> uh, I know. It's just, I, I, I was thinking about license plates, and I'm like, by design. Ooh, I like that. And then it, yeah. Eh, I, I'll make something up and I'll, <laughs> but that's it. Any other thoughts, questions? Hi. So uh, my name's Anna. I work Hi, here Anna. in Berkeley at Central IT. Um, I love what you were talking about as far as being as inclusive as possible and talking to as many different people as possible. And I wanted to make sure the audience considered uh, users with, dis with disabilities when they're thinking about that kind of audience. Um, yep specifically for the web users who can't use a mouse or have trouble using a mouse, and that can include 
folks who maybe broke their wrists last week going skiing or someone who's blind and uses a screen reader to access the web. And I mostly, my coworker who's blind wanted to be here and talk about this, so I'm speaking on her behalf. <laughs> um, but if you are at Berkeley, and this is a shameless plug, you have a free resource available to you for that, and that's the web access team. So keep that in mind, because I think that you're gonna make the product even better if you make take that into consideration. Yeah, so that wasn't a question, it was a comment, it's a good one, I'll actually comment to it. Um, one of the things that I did was um, a gentleman that works with me, Vinay Dixit, when we were looking for a um, person to head up our accessibility department, we interviewed all these folks and then one day Jenison Akshay walks in and he's blind. <laughs> and we're like, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. Right? So what Jenison has been able to bring us in a lot of cases is not only how do we make our own application more accessible, but how do we make collaboration sessions more accessible, reader notes. There's a lot of things that we used to use to even where maybe text was embedded as an image. Now we make sure that it's real text the whole bit. So it's an incredibly good point. You need to be as accessible as humanly possible to everybody that you're working with and make all those voices heard. Great point. Sure, hi. I've been uh, designing products for 40 years, and the question is, how do you deal with um, presidents of companies, VPs of engineering, who think they're designers, and also uh, companies uh, that don't have the insight for good design based on Me Too design, it costs too much, it won't take the risks. Uh, yeah. I just, and also I seem to do 20% of my time is doing their, their design yeah. just to prove it doesn't work or, and it's a little tricky it's very to tricky. keep your job. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's your name? I'm sorry. Oh, Daryl Hunger. Hey, Daryl. I'm Steve. Okay. So um, I'll give you two answers. There's the uh, answer that I'll give from when I started my career and there's an the answer now. The reason I'm going to give you two is because the world changed. The world changed significantly because of this. And I think that in a lot of cases, um, what I have seen, convincing companies, engineers, VPs, the whole bit, about good design is now an ROI thing. So I think it's become a lot easier. I can show you the return on investment. We'll be able to have better customer acquisition. We'll get more eyeballs and make more revenue if that thing's easier to use. You don't believe me? Apple versus Microsoft, right? So I don't have to have that debate any longer. I did three years prior ago, and what I would do with any organization that I joined is that was one of the things that I would spend a lot of time doing was not educating the executive team because that didn't make any sense. Finding out where their head was at and really kind of asking them questions about, so who are we building for? What are we trying to do? What do you believe we haven't been doing well that's making you say that you need someone like me? I would always make a business case for it, always. I would also try not to use the word design a whole bunch. I would say user experience and how people approached the product. Um, there was one company that I was interviewing for before I went to LinkedIn where I asked them if I could have a conversation with their call center to get the logs of what the top 20 most complained about things were and how long had those things been on the logs. And I said that through good design, we could actually reduce that considerably, reducing the overall amount of call volumes, making it so we don't need as many people that are answering the phones and raise our NPS score. And by speaking to them that way, where I was talking to them the language of business, not the language of design that they think is way touchy-feely and ethereal, I think that I made a really good impact, got the offer, went to LinkedIn anyway. Did, did, did that answer your question? Yeah. Super cool. Hi. Hi, my name is Rebecca. I'm the career director for the School of Information. Shameless plug, hire our students, they're awesome. Nice. Um, <laughs> question got time. Right here. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> they're over there. Uh, <laughs> the hands. question I have, I'm stealing from them actually, is a great question that, like, to close an interview with. And it's, you go back 20 years in time to yourself maybe as a new designer. What is the advice you would give yourself 20 years ago when you were starting out? Never had that question. First piece I think I'd say is don't eat pizza as much. Um, <laughs> Okay, what would I tell myself 20 years ago? It's funny because I give these talks about dreaming big and I don't know if I dreamt big enough. You know, I think that 20 years ago, wait, how do you know I'm over 20? <laughs> I just now got that. <laughs> eh, that's sneaky, that's pretty sneaky. Um, I think that, um, I didn't dream big enough 20 years ago. 
And I think that I was so concerned about fitting in and being accepted that I wasn't being quirky and dreaming big and being gutsy. And, and it's the reason why talks like this resonate with me so much because I'm not only talking to all of you, I'm talking about myself back then. I wish I could go back in time and give myself this talk, you know? Um, there were a lot of things that I was told we would never be able to do and we've done all of them. And I wish that I'd had a lot more guts to say, no, I just believe this is going to be right and just pursued it. It doesn't mean that I wouldn't have worked someplace, but maybe I would just pursued it on my own time. But I spent a considerable amount of time back then trying to conform, didn't work for me. And I think there's a lot of stuff that now I see and I'm like, oh, I knew it. And my wife's sick of hearing it. I'm like, I, 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 she's like, no, you didn't. So I think that's really it. That and the lack of pizza. Hi. Oh, Oh. oh, I will get to you, I promise. You're like right here. You're like in my Hi. Hi, my name is Rachel Dezombeck. I'm a PhD student here. Rachel Dezombeck. Yeah, it's that's hard to spell. Yeah, but it's very Googleable. Um, nice. <laughs> So I'm a PhD student here and you touched briefly on uh, the challenges with diversity in Silicon Valley and we have the same challenges with uh, attracting and retaining women in engineering, yep. diversity in uh, electrical engineering, computer science. It's a big problem and I was wondering, one, if you could speak to a bit more of any success stories that you've seen through your contacts or yep. also how you in your own teams make sure that or how have you changed your hiring processes to really ensure that diversity is achieved? Okay, I'm gonna give you my answer, then you tell me if you think I gave you a good enough answer, because I don't wanna phone this one in, this isn't BS. Um, it's the reason that I said that I'm trying to change the conversation from diversity and inclusion to perspective. Here's why. There is this infuriating statement that comes my way when I talk about hiring underserved minorities. Let's think about how many underserved minorities I think about, oh wait, me. And what happens is this, whenever I say we need to hire more underserved minorities or women, I always get a man in the room that says, but well, we don't want to lower the bar. I think he thinks he's not being the most insulting jackass in the room when he says that. <laughs> but he is, because it means that he is already determined that if we were to hire underserved minorities or women, that they will not do a good enough job. Therefore, he doesn't want to lower the bar. Interestingly enough, when I say we need to bring a different perspective into the company, you want to build for millennials, hire millennials. You want to be an international company, where do you guys want to serve? You know, Brazil, we should probably hire Brazilians. People go, oh, that's novel, yeah, that that's, makes perfect sense. <laughs> And I'm like, 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 I honestly have these out of body moments when I'm like, you know I just said the same thing, right? But I, I just don't go there. So very similarly to the question I answered earlier about speaking to executives, one question I always ask is, who's your target audience? Where do you want your business to go? Where do you want to grow? What are the demographics that you want your business to grow in? So when people say to me, it would be great if we could get more women to use our product, I look around and go, then the Sausage Fest should probably stop and we should hire more women. <laughs> and seriously, it, it, it's interesting because I say we need a female perspective in the room if we're going to do this. Now, I don't mean to tote my own horn, but my design team is 58% female, our leadership team is 63. I know those numbers because my HR team and I go over them quarterly. I absolutely make sure that we have as much a diverse perspective as humanly possible because we need to build software for everybody. So that's my success story. Did that answer your question? Super cool. All right, we'll take the last question. Wait, 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 wait. it's oh, gotta sorry. be her. Yeah, it's her, I this promise. is her, it is her. I made a promise. Um, okay. We got you covered. Okay. okay. So um, you talked about a lot of qualities of designers, and they sounded a lot sort of like personality characteristics, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of looking at background and stuff, things that students could actively participate in, maybe they have a lot of design demands in their academic program, but sort of what, what way would you recommend that they sort of round out to become those people you described? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I've actually never thought of them as being personality um, attributes, and maybe they are, so I'm gonna think that through, because if it's personality, then I'm not being fair, because you either are who you are, right? I'm talking about the way that you approach your work, because there's the what. So I, you know, I designed water bottles. How? It's the how that I think is very important. So when I'm talking to students, I just ask them, what was your thought process, and how did you consider other people um, thinking outside the box? What if you didn't need plastic, other materials? Just asking yourselves questions. What I see a lot in academia is students look for that list. Like, I did this, 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 and this, so it's good, right? And no, it feels like crap. 
and yes, you created a water bottle, but it doesn't feel right. There was something that was missing from it. It's that level of emotion that I think I just always try to inspire everybody with and say, it is part of the user experience. Emotion is part of the user experience. So don't be afraid to show it. Find some way to see that into what you're building. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Super nice. cool. All right. Thanks for your time. Everybody. Okay. In the words of the humble Steve Johnson, oh, let's, no. you know, dream big. Let's uh, have fun and get shit, get shit done. done. Okay, thank, thank you. you for a great visionary talk. Thank you, Steve. Also, I want to uh, make sure that we thank uh, all of our staff, and also this was jointly done uh, with the Art Research uh, Center, and so please, uh, hopefully we'll see you back next Friday. So thank you, everyone that helped out. And thank